Welcome everyone to Zoom in the Books this afternoon. Um, we have a great lineup for you this afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have three multi-award winning authors. We have Don Helan, who uh, was in the service, retired from the Pentagon. We have Joe Burkhead, who was an environmental attorney. And we have Dennis Hetzel, who is director of the Ohio Press Association. So we have a varied background. We've got thrillers, uh, political thrillers, and environmental thrillers to talk with you about today. Um, we're going to start off asking each of these authors to um, talk to us a little bit about themselves and the inspiration for their books. And Don Helan, would you like to start? You bet, Kathy. Thank you very much. And I'm delighted to be here and I appreciate the invitation. Um, you mentioned that uh, I was in the military. I, I joined the Army and I spent almost 30 years in the Army. And during that time, I had a variety of assignments uh, stateside as far as overseas in Germany and, and Vietnam. And when I came out of um, the, uh, the military, I was trying to figure out what next? You know, there's not a big demand in the civilian world for a guy who's pretty good at writing army regulations. So I took a travel writing symposium and, from the Washington Post, and it was so helpful. I've been about six years as a travel writer, and then I got the bug to start um, writing fiction. And it took me about three years, and I finally was able to, uh, to get a book published and been having some pretty good success uh, ever since. And recently, uh, because of the COVID-19 and all that, um, Kathy and I started doing a Zoom program on how to write a memoir. And then we drafted and completed uh, Voices from the Pandemic, which is a uh, anthology, which has 32 memoirs in them. The anthology has won a, a Mother's Gold Choice Award. It won the best anthology at the New England Book Festival and a number of other awards for which we are, are really pleased. As far as inspiration, uh, my latest, I'd like to just talk for a minute about my latest novel, It's, it's Missing. Um, what I've done is I've tried, to, I've used my hero is an army colonel who works for the president's national security advisor. And of course, I've been able to use my experience from the military as well as the 10 years I, I served in the Pentagon as, as background to make these stories really realistic. Now, when I uh, try to write a, when I try to start writing a um, thriller, I start, I try to get a number of um, plot lines so that uh, I can kind of switch my reader from one plot line to another. And that way, when something exciting has happened, you switch it over and you switch back and forth and you, you keep their attention. Well, in Missing, I actually ended up with four plot lines. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd recently been to a high school reunion. And you know, there's quite a, can be quite a, quite a bit of suspense in that because you haven't seen people for a long time. You're not sure, sure what they're doing, what they've been doing, have they changed or whatever. So we open with uh, a reunion and that's, uh, we have an incident there that really starts the, uh, the program, move, the book moving. And then of course, last year, you'd have to live in a cave to not realize there was a presidential election going on. So I thought, why not? You know, that's kind of what, um, uh, suspense writers are always doing, why not? So I created a third party candidate and I've always been interested in artificial intelligence. And I did some research and I thought, well, what we'll do is we'll have the um, uh, third party candidate use that article, uh, uh, use that artificial intelligence to really cook the books by hacking into, you know, the, the Elections are basically run out of the states, as you probably realize now. And I had my candidate uh, hook into the computers in about a half a dozen states by using artificial intelligence in order to cook the books and to win the election. Um, 
and my hero has got to try to figure out what's going on and how to stop it. And then the third part is uh, I have a number of friends who are beginning to encounter some memory issues and some of them are able to uh, to get into these memory units and be well cared for and taken care of and it's a wonderful thing what they do but I thought suppose that's not the way this particular memory unit worked and we have a couple of hospitals that that treat patients uniquely uh, in their in their memory unit so that's that basically the inspiration was these four different uh, uh, plot lines that uh, I thought we could um, tie together. Um, the other thing I'd like to just briefly mention is, you know, we're doing a lot of virtual programs and we're always happy to do that. Uh, but we're looking forward to getting involved back seeing people. Miss seeing my readers so much. And I've always been very active with our statewide writers group, which is Penn Writers. International Thriller Writers has some terrific programs. And Mystery Writers of America, they have a huge uh, library commission committee. And so what we are able to do is set up programs with libraries here in the Northeast. And we've had a lot of fun going to a variety of libraries and it's a great way to meet people. Plus Kathy has a number of um, book signings for us whether it be the uh, International Library Conference, the American Library Conference, or the terrific uh, Christmas program uh, down in North Carolina, and a variety of others. So it's a great opportunity for us to get out and to meet people. So I think uh, I'll uh, let it there for now, Kathy, and, and turn it over to the next person. Thank you, Don. Um, I know you mentioned in the beginning about uh, the memoir workshops. Um, we've all learned a lot from Don this year about writing creative nonfiction. And I think that's something authors don't think about sometimes. Um, that series is available on our YouTube channel uh, if you'd like to take a look at it. Um, our next author is Joe Burkhat. Um, Joe, would you like to tell people about your books and your background, please? Thank you very much, Kathy. And uh, welcome, everybody. And it's a pleasure to be talking with you. Um, my name is Joel Burkat, and I am uh, now a full-time author. I started out my career and had a 40-year career as an environmental lawyer, uh, initially working as an assistant attorney general with the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Resources and then working in private practice for most of my career. I will say that when I was much younger, I liked to write and I uh, was doing writing uh, all the way through college and law school. But once I became a lawyer, I, I found that I just didn't have the time to be able to devote to writing. And so I really allowed it to fall by the wayside. So every now and again, I would pick it up again and write and even had a short story published when I was 40 years old. But uh, probably uh, 14 years ago, I had the opportunity, I was actually stuck way up in Northern Maine and uh, in a town called Lubeck, Maine that didn't have very good cell phone coverage. It didn't have very good um, internet coverage. And I had a laptop and I couldn't do any work that day. So I, I decided to write down one of the stories that had been bouncing around in my head for a long time. And I wrote that one. And then when I was done writing it, I wrote a second one. And that year I wrote uh, maybe a dozen or so different short stories and then I started writing novels. And uh, now I have two published novels. The first one published by Headline Books is called Drink to Every Beast. And the second one, the one that just came out in February is a mid-range, just like the poster behind me. And uh, it's it's been uh, great fun for me to be able to uh, convert my passion as an environmental lawyer into my passion as a writer and to be able to write uh, environmental legal thrillers. Although that's not all I write and I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, in any event, just to, to give you the rest of my writing uh, background, I, I've now written a total of uh, seven manuscripts. Two of them have been published. There's a third book uh, that I'm just finishing up right now. It's in the uh, same series as Drink to Every Beast in a Mid-Rage and that's called Strange Fire. Um, Drink to Every Beast is about dumping of hazardous chemicals into the river. A mid-rage is about uh, a strip mining permit battle. 
And uh, the new one that will hopefully come out in maybe in a year or so is called Strange Fire. And that one is about fracking. Uh, and again, I've worked on all of these different kinds of cases over the course of my career. So um, what inspires these stories in particular is that, uh, you know, I've, I've worked on a lot of cases. I've had a lot of um, bits and pieces of cases that I, that I incorporate into my stories. None of my stories are about a particular case that I've worked on. I, I wouldn't do that, but there, there are probably little bits and pieces of things that I've encountered over the course of my life uh, that I do incorporate into my stories. And uh, the first story was actually, Drink Terry Beast was actually based on a real case, one that I was not involved in, but one that was widely reported in the news that was in my office when I worked at DEP or DER as it was called back then. And then I, I made a totally fictional version of that story. A Mid-Rage is about a permit battle. And in this war between really two different sides with uh, DEP located in the middle, you have on the one hand, a uh, mine operator named uh, Ernest, Ernest Renati, and he's got a mining company called Rhino Mining Company, and you can actually uh, see Rhino's uh, logo right here, backwards, the logo's right there on the helmet, and um, he's got a mining company. He's very unhappy with a, uh, a permit decision that DEP has made. He doesn't like the conditions that they placed on it, and then on the other hand, you've got the neighbors who are very, very unhappy that any permit at all was issued. By the way, this is a very, very commonplace situation uh, that government agencies are often finding themselves in. And it's also very commonplace for there to be a, a real battle or a war even uh, between the sides. But what makes this case a little different is that Mike Jacobs, my, uh, my main character uh, in these stories, he is stuck in the middle because he's got to defend the permit uh, against the neighbors, and he's got to uh, defend the challenge uh, by Rhino, and th this is one big case in which all three are located, are, are found. Renati is a real character, and he's a um, real psychopath. The neighbors are not particularly uh, clean-handed either. They, they've got their issues, uh, and Mike is just trying to do the best job that he can. Now, Mike has a particular perspective, and that is that he wants to protect the environment, but he's, he is stuck. He really has to defend the permit, uh, which puts him in a very odd and awkward position. At the same time, um, he ends up being blackmailed and, uh, and he's got to uh, work to assist the neighbors. So it's, it's a, it, it, it's, like I said, it's little bits and pieces of a lot of different cases. And I think it, it uh, comes together in a really uh, great story about, about uh, this permit battle that takes place. And uh, one thing I have done is I've certainly um, fictionalized what actually happens in a real case. Uh, if this were a real case, the case would go on for perhaps years. I compress everything so that it takes place over a relatively short period of time. Uh, also, there's a romance that's involved in the story, uh, Mike and his best friend, Nikki Kane. And uh, it's really that romance becomes a very, very integral part of the story because things happen during the story and Mike does certain things because he does have very, very strong feelings for Nikki. In any event, I, I think the story uh, really hits it on all different levels in terms of uh, being a realistic story in, in many regards about what happens in mining permit battles. I think it, it shows a side of Mike who is a, um, a very well-meaning and determined and really smart and good lawyer. There's the legal thriller component of it, um, because of my experience as a trial lawyer, an environmental trial lawyer for that matter, I was able to incorporate quite a few scenes that I think are pretty exciting scenes of the uh, legal battle that's taking place. And um, I, I do have to say that I worked very hard to try to make them as realistic in a way and also as non-realistic in another way. It's, it's what's realistic about it is these kinds of things might happen in the lawyer's dream case. And a lot of the, there's a lot of um, boring downtime that also takes place during a trial. And I, I cut all that stuff out. So you're not gonna read the boring stuff that happens in a trial, but you do read about the exciting things that happen, again, sort of compressed into one, one uh, big case. So uh, there is a very significant uh, legal thriller component to it. I've read uh, reviews written by uh, independent reviewers who really have um, enjoyed the legal thriller components. 
I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that I'm a John Grisham or anything, but I would compare my story to John Grisham's uh, stories, uh, Grey Mountain, um, The Appeal, The Pelican Brief, his environmental legal thrillers. So um, I have a great time doing this. I think my readers uh, have reported back to me that they're enjoying the story. Uh, and I look forward to uh, my next book when it comes out, Strange Fire. Let me say that I am also uh, delighted to do virtual programs and happy to do a, an hour long or a more than hour long program about environmental legal thrillers or to do a, a talk about uh, environmental uh, writing or to do a talk about um, writing in general. And I've written on all of those different things that you can find on my blog on my, at, at joelburkat.com. I'm happy to do book clubs. I, I was doing book clubs uh, in person up until COVID, but I, I would be happy to do book clubs uh, virtually as well. And uh, when the time is right, I'll be happy to do personal appearances again. I, I really love getting together with people who are readers and who enjoy uh, uh, reading the reading world and, and want to hear from me. And, and I'm delighted to do that, as well as book signings, of course. That, that's always a lot of fun to do that. So um, I, I'm happy that Kathy has put this program together. And let me also say, uh, Headline Books and their Zoom into Books program is really extraordinary. I mean, I, I don't know how Kathy pulled it together so quickly. Uh, COVID hit, if you recall, uh, maybe the second week, third week of um, March last year. On April 1, Kathy had Zoom into Books already up and running. And she's done, I believe, over 200 programs now, Kathy. And it's just been terrific. I, I've done a number of programs. I know the other writers on this call, on this program, have done uh, programs and on a variety of things. So it's been a lot of fun doing it and and hats off to uh, Kathy and to Headline Books for putting together Zoom into Books. This has just been awesome for us as writers and hopefully awesome for you too as readers. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Joel. <laughs> you know, we couldn't have done any of this without the wonderful authors that we have. We so appreciate your participation and um, uh, we've had several people join us a little bit late. I'd like to welcome them. Uh, we're talking with award-winning authors, Don Heelan, Joe Burkett, and Dennis Hetzel today. Um, these gentlemen and all of the headline authors are available for virtual and in-person visits. And listening to our first two speakers so far today, and Dennis is coming up next, you know, you could have one, two, three, or four authors come to your library virtually and do a workshop. All of these guys are top-notch writers. They can speak to uh, tense, pace, character development. So, um, that's something to think about. And Joel mentioned book clubs. Um, if you do have a book club and you'd like to read um, any of the author's book, and if you contact me through my website, through our website, headlinebooks.com, I'll be happy to give you a book club discount so we can send you the books and then you can invite the author to speak to the group. They love to do that. Um, next up, we have Dennis Hetzel. Dennis, would you please tell people about your books and your sure. forthcoming book? Sure, glad to. Thanks. And thanks, everybody, for being here. And thanks, as always, to Kathy and the team at Headline Books. Uh, it's really a pleasure to work with you all. Um, I say you all now because I live in Holden Beach, North Carolina, even though I'm from Chicago, as you can probably tell from my accent. And I'm a journalist. I was an editor, reporter, uh, publisher later on, and an association exec. And, uh, you know, my joke line was, and, you know, very relevant today with all the attacks that go on, is I was often accused of writing fiction, but I never did it, at least not on purpose, until I, you know, started working with headline books. And, um, you know, I saw Steve Berry, who I think a lot of you on this call would know is a terrific, you know, major a thriller writer uh, speak in Columbus, Ohio, a few years ago. And something he said really stuck with me. He said, you know, there's a myth about you write what you know. And he said, it's not really a myth, but what's more important is to write what you're passionate about. And, and then, you know, it occurred to me that if you're fortunate enough to write about something you do know about and what you're passionate about, then you really got something going. And I think, I'm, I would suspect Joel would agree with this, I've always been passionate about sports and I've always been passionate about politics. Um, 
and particularly growing up in Chicago as a fan of the Cubs and the Bears and the Chicago sports teams. And when, as I researched the two books, which both center around sports and politics, I realized I didn't know as much as I thought I did, and I had to do research, and uh, and that was part of the fun. And then, you know, later, and one of the things that struck me, when you, when you say you write thrillers about sports and politics, they sound like guidebooks. And I was really, I've really been touched by how many women uh, have told me how much they enjoyed the books. And I, I thought kind of, um, you know, at the kind of the lower level, it's because I don't overdo the jock stuff. It's not about sports statistics or inside baseball. Should you really bunt with no one strike, two strikes and a man on first and two outs? We don't do that. They're really about characters and stories. And I finally realized only after I published two books with Kathy and soon to be a third, um, I, I wasn't passionate about sports and politics. What I really realized I was passionate about and what I really like writing about is the prices people pay to achieve success at these highest levels. And there's, you know, really, really successful people in any field are usually very flawed and have played made tremendous sacrifices and choices, often ethical, bad choices, you know, to get to where they are. And that's really what these books are about. And I didn't even realize that's what those books were about until I was a couple years into this, which kind of fascinates me at any rate. So the story behind the first book, Killing the Curse, is uh, one of my best friends is another one of Kathy's authors, Rick Robinson. Rick and I worked together in Cincinnati when I worked for the Cincinnati Inquirer. And um, we were on a road trip one day, I think going to uh, the state capitol in Kentucky uh, to do some lobbying on a Chamber of Commerce thing. And uh, you know, we started talking about sports. I said, and this was before the real world Cubs had won the World Series. And I said, well, you know, what if the Cubs are in a World Series and there's a crazy fan who would do anything to make sure they won? And Rick goes, that's a book. Uh, and, and because he had an in with Kathy, Kathy thought that might be a book too. And that if Rick vouched for me, you know, maybe there was a chance I knew what I was doing. And um, so Killing the Curse, is about the Cubs are in the World Series. There's a crazy fan who will do anything to make sure they win. The President of the United States is a um, diehard um, Cubs fan, much like Obama, who you may recall as a White Sox fan. He's also sort of the moderate Republican. I think a lot of us wish we could vote for if I can be political for a second. And, and at any rate, he gets sucked into this at the same time. So there's a much deeper plot at work than just whether the Cubs um, win the World Series. And the, one of the ironic twists in the book without giving too much away is that you, for those of you who are sports fans, you may recall the, there's the famous scandal in 1919 when the White Sox fixed the World Series. Uh, gamblers got to the White Sox and they threw the series so that the Cincinnati Reds uh, could win the World Series. Well, in this case, the authorities need the Cubs to fix the series uh, and their opponents, in this case, the Red Sox, to make sure the Cubs win because so much is at stake. It, the Cubs have to win the seventh game or lives will be lost. So uh, Killing the Curse did pretty well and um, well received. And then I, thought, I felt the characters had more stories to tell. And in Seasons of Lie, Season of Lies, the second book, it picks up in the following season. Uh, my president, uh, Luke Murphy, is running for re-election. He's got a very hardcore um, Christian extremist uh, on the right, kind of a typical liberal Republican on the left. It's a three-way race. The Cubs star pitcher, who's really the center of the story, a guy named Trey Van Omen, uh, who had been traded to the Cubs, um, decides to get involved in politics. And as would actually happen in the real world, you know, once you decide to get involved in politics, the politics of destruction uh, takes off. And uh, not only is his life threatened and people around him, there's efforts to destroy his career, there's steroid scandals. Meanwhile, um, the president's trying to win re-election and there's all this religious fervor. Uh, I think Don talked about multiple plot lines that have been, you know, set off by um, a comet that passes through an eclipse in the shape of, um, of a cross. Uh, which you can imagine the fervor that would set off and ends up killing people in the Islam an Islamic portion of uh, Indonesia. And so, um, you know, so that so things take off from there. Um, 
and and that that sort of that those two books together sort of resolve resolve that story, although they don't have to be read in order. The uh, the new book, uh, which will be out later this year, is called Azalea Bluff, and is quite a departure from that. It it's set in uh, Brunswick County, North Carolina, where I live now. It involves a um, strange object that crashes on a football field. There's this young uh, millennial uh, woman uh, reporter uh, who's lost several newspaper jobs and is trying to get a be run a successful local news website. She goes out of the field and she disappears. And the backstory involves um, secret Nazi research, which actually is very well documented. A lot of it is tr in fact true at the end of World War II and a lot of the uh, UFO, documented UFO uh, experiences from the 1950s and 60s. So that's a little bit about what Azalea Bluff is about. And just real quickly, um, to build on something I think Joel said, it's been, it really is a lot of fun to do these things and you end up going off in different directions. And one of the most interesting things I've been able to do that's been well received, thanks to Kathy, is uh, I did a program on the search for my birth parents. I'm adopted and very late in life, I made the, the surprising discovery that I'm 50% Ashkenazi Jewish. And I ended up uh, tracking down um, my, unfortunately both my birth parents are no longer with us, but both families have been welcoming. Uh, we did that as a zoom into books, a thriller writer searches for his birth parents about how I, uh, how I uncover that. And I've now done that program for some genealogical groups. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, we're, um, you know, it's, it's fun to do book clubs and programs and, you know, whether we're talking about environmental law or our experiences as journalists or, uh, the, our books themselves and the craft of writing, which is always an adventure. Uh, these things are really fun to do. And we're, uh, you know, I, I know we all welcome the opportunity to do that stuff. The uh, birth parent e episode of Zoom into Books that we did was amazing. You got a lot of feedback from that, didn't you? I did. Um, you know, um, for those of you that have done genealogical research, uh, what I learned uh, when you're using Ancestry or 23andMe, I, some, I think a lot of people play that game Mastermind, where you have different colored pegs. And so you have, you know, well, it's an all process of elimination. Well, I, I know this can't be green. I know it can't be blue. So therefore it must be red. And that's what you're doing with these family trees is you're trying to isolate and discover a lost ancestor. Or in my case, looking for my birth father, you keep eliminating uh, trails. They're sort of like plot lines in a way. <laughs> you're sort of eliminating trails until there's only one possible path that explains everything and everything fits. And when I finally uh, identified my birth father's family in particular, there was only one path that would explain the genetic relationships I had with, with other people. So uh, it was, I mean, I'm 68 years old. It was truly a, a lifelong quest and a mystery I really didn't think I would ever solve. And I, I wouldn't have been able to without uh, the technology we have today, uh, with, especially with the DNA, the DNA testing. Oh yeah, that's great. And that te the DNA testing is also a good plot line for no. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I have an idea for a book that um, involves some of that. So see if I have another one in me after Azalea Bluff. And, and, yeah. and in talking about Kathy, if I'm talking about Azalea Bluff, I should give a shout out to uh, the late Ed Galloway. The book actually is based on a radio drama that Ed Galloway wrote. Um, who I met at the Charlotte Christmas show at the headline books table a few years ago. And Ed had uh, done, had done this old fashioned radio drama and he was looking for someone to turn his story into an actual novel. And then as I was rat and I agreed to do it um, and, you know, obviously added an, a lot of plot and changed quite a bit. And he unfortunately died uh, unexpectedly of a heart attack uh, just as I was wrapping up the book. And, um, his widow, Carolyn, and I uh, agreed that the show needed to go on. You know, Ed was a radio guy through and through and would have uh, would have wanted the, uh, the show to go on. So uh, he's not around, although maybe he is. Uh, 
you know, his, Maybe uh, he is. <laughs> yeah, I learned a lot about UFOs from Ed. That was one of his passions. So yeah. I'm pretty excited about Azalea Bluff. I think, I think it's going to be a lot of fun uh, for people to read. And it, it's uh, an interesting, interesting story. One of the interesting parts of it was, um, you know, me being an older boomer guy and my main character is a millennial aged woman. And I found, a, I, I've sought out a lot of talented female draft readers uh, from, ranging from my daughter to Carol Costello, a former CNN anchor, and Stephanie Story, a very successful uh, author uh, of the book *Oil and Marble*, uh, to make sure I, you know, it, it, you know, the story felt right and the characters felt honest. That's that's one thing that the author has to do. You have to find the voice of the book. That's very important. Um, for all three of you, we've put together some photos, and if uh, we can start the slides, I'd like for each of you, as the photos come up, to tell us what we're looking at, um, maybe the events and where you were. Um, well, let's see. This is uh, a number of book signings that... Um that I've done uh, on the left, um, I think we're in Harrisburg at the uh, Midtown Scholar. We did a number of book signings there. We're blessed to have a wonderful uh, uh, book uh, seller there in, uh, they do an annual uh, conference uh, for Harrisburg Book Conference. And it was great to have some of my good friends the um, the lady in the yellow dress and the lady uh, in the in the blue shirt. The, we worked together uh, when I was at um, uh, before I moved down here. We put together a program under an arts council uh, called uh, a novel idea, where we brought together six authors, and they taught over a one year period. Um, we had 20 uh, students per class. And I think over the four years, we had about 74 students. And we, I think, helped a number of them uh, along on their uh, writing uh, journal. And to the right of that, I think, is a, um, a conference that I did at uh, Penn Writers. is a statewide writers group. And uh, it is such a great organization. There's uh, almost 500 writers. And as a matter of fact, uh, this year, because of the uh, COVID, we will not be able to, to gather. What they do one year, they're in uh, Pittsburgh. The next year, uh, they're uh, right here in Lancaster. And uh, we'll do it virtual, but we're going to do a full uh, three-day weekend. In, uh, and we'll be doing that. As a matter of fact, Joel and I will be doing um, uh, some uh, discussion and some signings there. And, and below that, that looks like one of the conferences that, um, that I did with uh, Kathy. I'm not sure if that's, if that's the uh, American Library Association or our, our um, conference in, um, in uh, Charlotte. I think the bottom one is the Southern Christmas Show. Yeah, that's, that's, what, uh, that's, what, that's what it looked like initially. And then on the upper right is uh, an, another conference that, uh, that we did together. And, and you see some of my good friends there. Uh, uh, Rick is uh, actually, he's got his back to you, but Rick is the one that introduced me to Kathy and, and, uh, and brought me into uh, headline books. And I think this one uh, may be at the American Library Association conference. It is. That was in... Washington, D.C., 2019. Yeah. So. And oh, it would be good to go back again. We had a lot of fun there, and they have bring it. You know, when you're dealing with libraries, it's just wonderful. Because what I have, a, I have a friend who's the um, uh, head of the uh, Library Association here in um, uh, Lancaster. And she said they did a, a national survey. And with all that's going on, you know, do you trust the news? Do you trust politicians? They, uh, they came with the conclusion that librarians are the most trusted people, <laughs> that people trust the most to where they get their uh, news. So uh, it's been just an awful lot of fun. 
and here uh, on the left, we've got, uh, I've been active with the Military Writers Society of America for a number of years. And, and many of you are aware that so many of our veterans come back from whether it be Vietnam or the different overseas assignments with all kinds of problems. And, and we help them uh, write their story. And uh, our vice president, uh, she, she wasn't military, but bless her, in 2004, she lost her uh, boy in Iraq. And she said, you know, I went into the blackest hole for two years. And over the next two years, she was able to write her way out of that. And so each year we have um, a, a conference and uh, we'll get together and we'll honor a lot of these vets. And then we pick the best book of the year. And, and uh, it's just a great opportunity for, um, for, for vets to, to, uh, to tell their story. And over here on the, on the right, I, I think this is one of the, maybe one of the live, oh, this is Thriller Fest. I think uh, each year I, I did a number of uh, presentations at uh, International Thriller Writers. And I believe that's where we are now. And I think down uh, the one below that, I, th I think maybe a, uh, another one with, with Thriller Fest. I, I'm not sure. I, I recognize the guys, but I'm not sure where exactly that was. I think uh, maybe all three of you have been to Thriller Fest. Um, that's in New York City, and that's a very exciting thing for, for the authors to do. Uh, actually, to actually, they have a wonderful program. It's called the Debut Author Program. And when you first get into um, Thriller Fest, you can spend a year and they'll pick, uh, there was 17 of us and it was like a pledge class. And they'll pick uh, a number of the best known authors and they'll, they'll teach uh, you. Um, and like our mentor in that one was Lee Childs. And he's kind of the one that led me to a series character that I have where all my books have the same series character. Now this uh, on, the on the upper left is uh, really uh, a good friend owns an independent bookstore in, in Harrisburg. And Michelle has been such a good friend. She has book signings and this, this was a book signing that we did at, um, at, uh, in, in Harrisburg. And the lady that's with me there is uh, her mother loves my books. So she always gets two and then <laughs> they trade off. So it's been great. And I look forward to getting back and spending time with Michelle again. And then um, the Hershey Library has got uh, an annual program that they have uh, every year. And I, I think that's where we are. And then the upper right, I think that's my friend Dick Patton. I haven't seen him for a while but uh, it's always good to, uh, to see them at, uh, at different conferences. Yes, and th that one is at the West Virginia Book Festival. Right. Uh, Joel, these are from your, your photos. Would you like to tell us what we're looking at? Sure, the, uh, the big picture on the left is the, um, the, the, the actual uh, uh, rollout of the launch of my book, Drink to Every Beast which we did at Midtown Scholar, the same bookstore that, uh, that Don was talking about a few moments ago. And uh, they really have a wonderful bookstore there. They both sell new books as well as used books. Their new book selection is extensive and you'd have everything there that you could possibly want to read, but their used book selection is just gigantic. And they have a very extensive program um, pre-COVID uh, in-person program. And as you can see here, there's, there were about 100 people there for my launch. And I was being interviewed by Harvey Friedenberg. And um, the uh, um, it, it was a lot of fun to do that. And, you know, like Don and, and uh, Dennis, we, we all love to do these programs. It's just so much fun. You get so much energy from the audience. You get great questions and you get to interact with the, with the uh, people there. Harvey Friedenberg was sitting there next to me. And actually, you can see us uh, in the uh, lower right-hand corner that's uh, actually on the stage. So that was Harvey uh, Friedenberg, who's a noted uh, book reviewer uh, for uh, many different book reviews. 
and he actually interviewed me, which was a lot of fun uh, being interviewed by Harvey. And uh, and he didn't give me the questions in advance, so I was really kind of uh, taken uh, by surprise on all of his questions. And then in the upper right hand corner is uh, myself, and I'm standing with uh, noted author Don Heelan uh, on the right. And Don, who's that on the left? Is that Laurie Edwards? You can tell, but in any event, uh, that was at um, a Christmas program that we did at um, Willow Valley, uh, which is a, a, a terrific, unbelievably large Christmas program that they have there. And uh, we were sort of at the author's table. So that was a lot of fun to be able to um, get together and sell our books and uh, interact with the folks who were there. And it, it was just a terrific time. Gigantic program, unbelievable. Uh, Don was talking before about uh, the, um, uh, the uh, debut authors program. And there I am in my debut authors class. I'm standing there in the middle of the pack. And you can see that there were quite a few authors who were there. Our uh, mentor that year was Steve Berry, who, by the way, also um, gave me a nice blurb for this book. He read my book and gave me a very nice blurb for it. Uh, but it really is for authors uh, who write thrillers to get into that program. It's just terrific. Uh, you have to be a debut author. In other words, your very first uh, published uh, fiction book. And uh, they put together many different programs for you. And you have this very nice program. Actually, what you're seeing here in the lower right-hand corner is they have a, a panel. And uh, each of the authors gets to speak for about a minute or two and just introduce themselves and their books. And, uh, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, really um, one of the fun things. And again, just another opportunity to talk. And then the, um, the picture in the uh, center of the story of the panel is a little bit of a, of a joke that I did. Um, we had an old Borders bookstore and uh, I sent this picture out um, uh, that I was a little late for my book signing at Borders bookstore. Unfortunately, um, the Borders was closed and had been closed for a while. And actually you can see a fence behind me uh, they're just getting ready to tear down the bookstore. There's, I think there's a hotel or something going there now, but uh, it is a shame that uh, we have fewer and fewer brick and mortar uh, bookstores. Fortunately, uh, Headline Books has a very, very good um, uh, presence on the internet. You can get books there and many bookstores. Actually, you know what I just found? And I, I was fascinated by this. Somebody said, you know, I think your book's on the Harvard Bookstore list. And I sure enough, I went to Harvard Bookstore and there was my book of Midrange. So I was very excited to see that. And, um, uh, but uh, unfortunately, I never did get to do a, a signing at uh, Borders. Now, what we have on this page on the left is me in New York City doing a program at Shakespeare and Company. And that was a lot of fun. It was a totally different kind of audience uh, New York audiences. And this was right on uh, Broadway in New York. So New York audiences are very different and I don't want to say this as a, as a put down anybody else but they have a they have a different kind of sophistication I'm not going to say it's more sophisticated it's a different kind of sophistication and uh, they read differently than uh, than other people read and the people who come to these programs at a place like Shakespeare and Company they're you know they're uh, you know, they were very they, they asked very pointed questions now talking about Thriller Fest um, this is me at uh, two different um, uh, programs. Uh, in the middle, uh, at top middle is uh, me standing with Steve Berry, uh, multi New York Times uh, 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 placing uh, author. And then the one below that is me and Harlan Coben. And one of the great things about Thriller Fest, which by the way, isn't just for writers, it's for readers as well. And I think that at least half the people who go there are readers because you get to literally get that close to some of your heroes. And I, I've read a lot of books by both Steve and by Harlan. And uh, both of those guys are there and they talk to people and they're happy to talk to you. I've met so many writers there over the years, you know, Stephen James, uh, Peter James. I mean, just, just so many people who are there and who are just, you know, rubbing shoulders with you. And, and like I said, if you're, a, um, if you're a reader, that's also fun to go and visit if you're in New York City. Sadly, it's going to be a virtual program this year, but it looks like the following year, 2022, it's going to be uh, live again. And then over on the right, I heard Don talking about um, another great uh, bookstore, actually in Enola called Cupboard Maker Books. And this is a book signing that we did at Cupboard Maker. 
So uh, again, we all love to do book signings. We all love to do the in-person programs. But in the meantime, we're happy to do the virtual programs. And I suspect, by the way, we're going to be doing virtual programs forever uh, going into the future. I did a pr virtual program for my law school, Vermont Law School. I think there might have been three people in Vermont and then people all over the country who were able to participate in that program. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't have been able to have all of those people at that program. So, you know, we'll, we'll do those, uh, those virtual programs. We're happy to do them as well. And, and it gives an opportunity for people who wouldn't otherwise be able to attend to come to a program. That's true. Um, and be before we leave that slide, um, I'm very proud to say that both Steve Berry and Harlan Coben have blurred the, some of the books that I've published, Joel's included. Um, and that, that's fun for us too. Oh and talking about the virtual aspect, um, <clears throat> when we do our booth events, when we get those started back up, uh, we're also going to zoom into books from the booth. So we'll be able to bring some of the people who couldn't make it to the booth right there with us so they can participate. So let's go to the next slide, please. I guess that's me. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, on the far left, uh, there's a huge uh, book festival in Chicago every spring. I'm sure it was canceled last year. So if you're writing a book about the Cubs and politics, you know, we're better to be in um, Chicago. So this is me in the uh, Chicago Writers Association, which is a group of for writers who are either from Chicago, like I am, or have some affiliation to Chicago. They have a booth, and I went up there to... Uh, you know, to talk about Killing the Curse and Season of Lies. And that also brings to mind, um, you know, one of the other fun things I do is I write book reviews now for booktrib.com and uh, Windy City Writes. And it's kind of fun to be on the other side of it. You see, you know, if I can do a really positive review for someone who's got, it's their first novel and they're, you know, starting as you know, starting their journey as a writer, uh, I've gotten such incredible feedback back from writers whose, uh, whose books I've reviewed and reading other people's work, you know, obviously also makes you a better, a better writer. So it's a real, um, win-win the, uh, the book trip. I think I just did Harlan Colbin's new book for, uh, booktrip.com. And I did Michael Conley, who is my, I'm not worthy, uh, writer, um, model, um, you know, for book trip, but I think it's actually more fun to do the the authors who are more less known or unknown. Uh, I wrote, I did a review of a book called Eon, E O N, about a tremendous amount of research this guy did on um, the Canadian Air Force's role in World War II, and this this plane's buried in a glacier um, in Norway, and I won't give the plot away, but I mean, it was just really fun to to give him a boost. So. Anyway, speaking of the Cubs, the Cubs have a um, farm team in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, just south of where I live, Class A, and I got a chance to throw out the first pitch for a Myrtle Beach uh, Pelicans game, and these are some, uh, my wife on the far right and some other friends of ours who, who came along to uh, watch me throw the first pitch, which I didn't, it, that 60 feet, six inches is pretty far, and I, I have to say I didn't, I should have practiced more beforehand. Uh, below that is my, my great friend, Heather Dugan, who's also a headline books author, uh, who writes uh, some self-help books. And this is Heather and I at a signing we did in um, Columbus, Ohio, when I ran the Ohio News Media Association. I was also a lobbyist for the eight years I was there. So I really got to uh, work out my, uh, you know, my political, uh, <laughs> my passion for politics uh, during those eight years. And then... Um, this is at a barn in the on the far right. It's at a, at a Barnes and Noble somewhere before a signing, and it might be the one in uh, Bristol, Tennessee. But I'm not sure. We did a after Season of Lies came out. We did quite a few signings at um, Barnes and Nobles, uh, particularly in the Midwest, uh, Springfield, uh, Naperville, Illinois, outside Chicago, uh, Tennessee, Columbus, uh, Joseph Beth Books in Cincinnati. We did we did quite a quite a few signings and uh, those are always fun to do. You meet a lot of people and uh, it's just really interesting. Um, 
a far left, uh, this is Fox 19 in Cincinnati. Uh, I got before the um, Books by the Banks, which is a great uh, book event in Cincinnati every year. Um, I did some, t I did a television appearance on Fox 19 on a Saturday morning to, to talk about the books. And I lived in Cincinnati at that time. So I, at that time, so I was a local, uh, local author. And, uh, uh, you know, for authors that aren't really well known or just trying to get known, these, these book festivals are really outstanding ways to not only get to meet a lot of people, but also get to know a lot of other authors. Uh, so I always recommend that. Center is uh, uh, Channel 6, the ABC and Fox outlets in, uh, in Columbus. And I was on uh, the morning show there with uh, their two uh, morning uh, hosts in, uh, in Columbus when I worked there. And this is uh, everybody's favorite headline books author, Rick Robinson and me uh, at uh, Joseph Beth uh, Booksellers in uh, when they had their uh, Northern Kentucky store uh, right at the, about the time Season of Lies came out. And Rick, of course, came over to, uh, uh, you know, to, to say hello and help out. And uh, Rick and I have done a number of things together. And then uh, the far left, I think this is at the Southern uh, Kentucky uh, Book Festival, which is just north of, um, of Memphis. Uh, that's in uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky at Western Kentucky University, another great event. And then in the upper right, that was, I was on uh, the morning uh, TV program uh, in that market. Uh, below, I think that's at Books by the Banks or at the Southern Kentucky Festival. And at that same festival, and I can't remember the band these uh, dudes are in. This is in the, uh, the the waiting room, the ready room for the TV station there. And these guys were on right before me. They were in kind of like a all progressive country band of some sort. Uh, nice guys, musicians, uh, which is what I might actually want to be when I grow up. And uh, um, I got a chance to show off my books to them. That's great, Dennis. It is interesting who you meet going to media events like that, TV and radio stations. Um, I know Landau, Eugene Murphy Jr. has run into several of his heroes, plus other people knew who he was and it's fun to make that connection. Um, all you guys have done a lot of media. I know Don Helan's been interviewed um, on the local TV station there several times too. Um, I'd like to, um, we're almost out of time here. Um, I'd like for all of you to, I know everybody has a favorite author, maybe somebody who has inspired you or a mentor um, I'd like for the three of you to speak to that. Don, you want to start? Sure. I have, I have two that are always at uh, the head of my list. I, I mentioned that uh, Lee Childs was uh, so good as, uh, as a mentor. And uh, it was terrific to get to know him and uh, uh, to be led by him. And then the other is the, and I guess, you know, I grew up in Minneapolis and John Sanford has got to be another <laughs> favorite of mine because he's got a, uh, uh, a mystery show. He's got a detective who is just incredible. And then he started a second series now that they're up to the state of Minnesota and, and the, he melds uh, humor together with a terrific story uh, and, you know, I, I always tell uh, readers, you got to uh, read like a writer. In other words, read slowly enough. And usually what happens when I read something by either Lee or uh, John Sanford, I'll get to page 10 and, and I'll be hooked. And I'll say, oh my gosh, how did he do that? And so then I've got to go back and figure out how they did that. And that's a great learning experience. So there are so many wonderful thriller writers, but um, those two are at the top of my list. Um, Joel, would you like to tell us who you read and who you have admired? Yes, um, I think in terms of non-thriller, um, one of the writers that I've really appreciated during the course of my life is Philip Roth. And I like Philip Roth because 
um, when I first read uh, Philip Roth, I, I thought to myself, how can anybody possibly write like that? I mean, you just have to break every, every glass window. You've got to break every glass ceiling. You got to break it all down uh, to be able to write like that. And um, even though he didn't write thrillers, he wrote books that were really terrific and inspiring books uh, in many regards. And also books that you just said, you know, they, they would just blow your mind in terms of what he was able to do as a writer and how he would delve into uh, the minds and passions of people. In terms of thriller writers, uh, one writer that I keep going back to that I really enjoy is Daniel Silva. I mean, Silva is a terrific writer. Um, he has one character, um, Don was talking before about having one character that you follow all the way through the story uh, line of all of the novels. I, I think Silver probably has um, at least 20 books out now. And every time I pick up a Silver book, I think to myself, oh, 400 pages, 500 pages, it's gonna take me forever to read it. And like a day later, I'm finishing it up and thinking to myself, where did that go? Um, it, it, his books are, are, are really, really terrific and, and books that I enjoy. So those are, those are two of my favorite writers. Um, Dennis, who, who do you like to read? That'd be a couple buckets, certainly in the genre of general thrillers, I'd say, you know, Michael Conley, who, maybe because he was, used to be a police reporter at the LA Times, and I was a police reporter in Galesburg, Illinois, and R Racine, Wisconsin, when I was starting my career. His plots are just like watches, just finely crafted watches. Nelson DeMille, for his sense of humor, and, and, um, Scott Turrell, who um, I think his books will survive as literature, you know, not just his great stories, especially his first few, Presumed Innocent as a, as a masterpiece. Um, and then, you know, as I was growing up and reading, I mean, I was actually influenced more by a lot of science fiction. I loved Isaac Asimov, the Foundation Trilogy, the, the, the ideas in great science fiction are unlike anywhere else. And I was influenced a lot uh, by the new journalism, uh, the nonfiction, Hunter Thompson, Tom Wolfe, um, and then uh, in the in the pure nonfiction, David Halberstam was, you know, I read about everything he did. Um, the Best and the Brightest is just going to always be the definitive book about the Vietnam War. So those are all, you know, different influences from from different directions. Well, you, you guys have done so well today. I want to thank you so much for coming. Um, you all really do write from the headlines, and your books are all so different. Um, we always try to market fiction according to the current headlines of the day, and you all hit the target every time. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us on Facebook today. We've reached the end of our time. Um, if you did not get to watch the beginning of this um, episode of Zoom Into Books, it will be available on the Headline Books Facebook page and the Zoom Into Books Facebook page. And in the coming weeks, it'll be on the Zoom Into Books YouTube channel. So thank you all very much, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.